Hi, my name is Kristen Brennan and I'm the Assistant State Soil Scientist and Soil Health Specialist with Minnesota NRCS. We are part of the U.S. Department of Agriculture and we work in partnership with the Minnesota State Fair at the Can You Dig It? Get the Scoop on Soil Health exhibit at Little Farm Hands. We're located at the north part of the fairgrounds on Machinery Hill. You can also find us at the Dirt Auditorium at the Agriculture and Horticulture Building. So today we're gonna to learn a little bit about soil, what it is and what we can do to protect it as a resource, both for Minnesota agriculture and things that you can do at your home garden as well. So let's talk a little bit about what soil is. So soil is made up of mostly the soil solids, so we call that our sand, our silts, and our clays. And the other half of soil is made up of our negative space or our pore space. Healthy soil looks a lot like a sponge. So the solid parts are the mineral fraction, those sand, silts, and clays. Um, and all these different holes, these pores, are where we have oxygen exchange and water exchange in our soils. So healthy soils uh, look a lot like this particular picture here. So this is a three-dimensional CT scan of a healthy soil core. And so these orange lines here are the earthworm burrows and the root channels that make up that negative space or that empty space that is our pores. And so if you think about our own bodies, what this reminds me of is our circulatory system or the veins and the arteries that are responsible for moving resources that we need to survive and thrive. And so those pore spaces in our soils are no different. They're responsible for moving oxygen and water and nutrients to the plant roots that need it. And not only that, but the majority of our soil microorganisms, the teeny tiny bugs that live in our soil, live in what we call the soil solution or the soil water that exists in these pore spaces. And so it's really critical that we maintain how these pore spaces are connected all the way to the soil surface. So if you think about it, when it rains on our soil surface and that water moves down through our soil, it actually creates a bit of a vacuum. And as the water moves down, it's pulling oxygen down into our soil. So when it rains, our soil actually takes a breath. Isn't that amazing to think of, our living, breathing soil? And so we really wanna make sure that we maintain the connectivity of these pore spaces. And the best way to do that is to not disturb our soil. So we don't want to plow or till our soil because that really limits our soil's ability to function properly and to move those resources, that water and oxygen down through our soil. And so a healthy soil looks a lot like this. So this is what we call soil structure or these little bits here we call a soil aggregate. And so these are made up of those sand, silt, and clay bits that are held together by something that we call carbon or soil orga uh, organic matter. Um, and not only that, but they're held together by glues uh, that are created by a lot of the uh, microbial populations that live in our soil. And so we wanna really make sure that we're creating an environment where we're building soil carbon and we're uh, making it hospitable for microorganisms. Uh, they help to really create a healthy and a strong soil. And so you can see how dark this soil is. So we know that that soil is very rich in carbon. And so you know a soil is healthy if uh, it has that dark, nice dark color. Also, we look at that structure. It looks a lot like granola or um, cottage cheese. That's what we're really looking for in a healthy soil. Not only that, but if you ever go out into your garden, the next time I want you to take a big deep breath of your soil. And a lot of times that earthy, sweet aroma, everybody is so familiar with. And that sweet earthy smell is actually created by uh, microorganisms called an actinomyces. Um, and that compound that gives that sweet earthy smell is called geosmin. And the amazing thing about that compound is uh, humans can detect it at like three parts per trillion. So it's really innately part of our DNA for us to be able to recognize a healthy soil, a soil that can support us um, as a human civilization. So that's kind of a, a really interesting factoid is that that earthy sweet aroma is, is really part of who we are as human beings to be able to recognize that. And so this healthy soil here looks a lot like, again, like a sponge. So a soil that unfortunately that's been um, managed and tilled and plowed continuously year after year um, over time will look more like this. 
And so this is a really compacted, cemented soil. And so really, an unhealthy soil looks a lot more like a brick. Um, and so you can imagine how difficult it must be for this particular soil to move water and oxygen down through those pore spaces that we looked at earlier. So this soil here is really lacking those pore spaces, and it's really a lot more difficult for that soil to function in the way that it's meant to function. All right, so let's talk a little bit more about soil structure and strength. So here I've got two different samples of soil. These are the same soil type, same soils that were collected in fields right across the road from one another. And here you can see that they look similar, their structure looks similar, but the main difference is their soil color. So our healthy soil here was uh, collected from a no-till field that has a diverse rotation of crops and cover crops, while this one here is a more conventionally plowed and tilled and managed field that has limited crop diversity. And you can see just how much less carbon and organic matter is in this conventional field. So I'm gonna get these wet here. And these are just, this is something easy that you can do at home too. These are just 99 cent kitchen sink strainers that you can fill with your garden soil and then kind of do the same test. So we're gonna just pour some water and let these soak for a minute and talk a little bit more about soil carbon. So this map here shows the distribution of organic matter or soil carbon in our soils across the country. And what you notice about Minnesota is we're really dark. So the darker we are on the map, the more carbon we have in our soils. And that's because historically Minnesota was under prairie vegetation and great expanses of northern forests. And both of those ecosystems are really efficient at capturing sunlight and creating carbon through photosynthesis. And this carbon and sugars are leaked out through the plant roots into the soils. And the majority of plants actually take about 70% of the carbon that it produces in these sugars and leaks that out through its roots. And the reason that it expends all of that energy to release 70% of those uh, compounds into the soil is that it attracts microorganisms. And these relationships that it builds with the microorganisms are really key. And so what these microorganisms do in exchange for the food that the plant is providing them is it helps to cycle nutrients and make them into more plant available form. And so really it's, it's really critical that our soils are working in this sort of uh, con in concert with the, the biological communities that live below ground. Uh, but every time human nature has been faced with an overabundance of a resource, the passenger pigeons, the, the great herds of bison, um, Originally, these, these resources seem inexhaustible, they seem infinite, uh, but they're really finite, and the same can be said for the carbon in our soils. They're not an infinite resource, they're a finite one, and the sooner that we start to manage our soils uh, for that, the better off we're gonna be. All right, so now that we've allowed these samples to sit, let's see how the strength of these soils are different once they're submerged in water. So here we've got our conventionally tilled soil, and here we've got our healthy soil. And we're gonna kinda of talk a little bit about food. We're at the state fair, so we have to talk about food. So what we're gonna do here is we're just gonna kinda of shake these around a little bit. And you can see that our darker, healthy soil looks a lot like chocolate cake, right? Or like brownie. Um, even though it's been submerged in that water and it's saturated, it's able to hold itself together. And that's because a soil that hasn't been disturbed, a soil that's high in carbon and has a lot of relationships with the microbial populations that live there, those microbes help to create glues that help keep that soil strong and help hold that soil together. But a soil that's been tilled and plowed year after year uh, it's a lot like a bulldozer coming through your bedroom. It makes it a really difficult place for those microbes to survive. And so they're not able to provide all of those benefits that they would in an otherwise healthy soil. So you can imagine if each of these fields were hit with a four or five inch rain, which we're happening to see more frequently in the last 10 years here than we've have ever really uh, in the history of agriculture. We're seeing more and more of these intense rainfall events. You can imagine how much different these two soils are gonna behave. This one here is gonna be more apt 
to have what we call soil erosion, where that soil is going to leave the field with the rainwater that, uh, that hits it, whereas this one is going to be more apt to stay in place. And we really want to make sure we keep our soil in place because if you think about all of the things that we add to our agricultural fields, pesticides, herbicides, fertilizers, uh, that not only do they cost money, but we want to make sure we keep their, they stay in place on the field to provide that benefit because we don't want them washing off into the surface waters and impacting water quality. All right, so kind of along the same lines, let's talk a little bit more about soil strength. So here we've got two jars of water. We'll move them up here. And we've got two soil samples. And these are taken from the same fields that our soil structure demo was taken from. This particular field is a no-till field, so they don't plow or till this field. And they also, again, have a lot of diversity in their crop rotation. They add cover crops. Uh, so there's that living root in the ground as long as possible during the growing season. And so really, when we talk about soil health, we're talking about five main soil health practices. The first one is to till or disturb the soil as little as possible. So really, ideally, we're looking for what we call a no-till system. So there's specific machinery or equipment that producers can utilize that don't plow or disturb the soil. And that really is the most beneficial sort of practice. The second one is to maximize diversity in our, in our crops. So we want to add additional crops into our cash crop rotation, or once that cash crop is harvested, to come back and add something called a cover crop. And this crop, we don't harvest it for profit, but what it does is it helps to keep that soil covered and helps to add that carbon continuously into that ground during the growing season. The next thing is we want to keep the soil covered. So by doing that, we want to minimize um, tilling in the residue. So keeping the crop residue from the previous year, it acts like a blanket and helps protect the soil from erosion. We want to keep a living root growing as long as possible in that soil during the growing season uh, so that it's continually feeding the bi biology that lives in the soil. And then the fifth uh, principle is to bring back livestock to the farm or to incorporate livestock where we can. We see on farms that are able to incorporate livestock and add manure into these systems, really see an increase in added benefit uh, to the system overall. So this particular one is from a soil health management system. And here is a great, you can see this pore space right here. So this is an, an earthworm burrow or a root channel. And so you can imagine how much water movement and air movement we have just through this one pore here. So that's our healthy soil. Again, this is the same soil type, but taken across the field. Now this one's been conventionally tilled. And you can see already the color is very different. You can even see that the structure is very different. We have sort of these horizontal lines. We call this platy structure. And this is structure that we see uh, pretty commonly in soils that are heavily managed or tilled year to year. So you can imagine how that would limit how water and oxygen can move down through the soil. And sometimes um, it's even an indicator of what we call compaction. So tillage at the same depth year after year will create sort of a dense layer in our soils. And it makes it really difficult for even roots to grow down through the soil. And a lot of times what you'll see is that roots once they hit that compaction layer, they'll actually have to grow sideways and find some sort of crack or pore before it can start moving down again. And so that takes a lot of energy then for that plant to have to move that root in that way. And that's energy that that plant would otherwise invest in producing grain or added root depth. And so really you're asking your plant to do extra work when you have to have, uh, have it work through a compacted layer in your soil. All right, so we're going to see how these two soils behave differently when they're submerged in water. So we've just got these baskets here. Here we go. And so what you notice right away is that as that water tries to move into the soil, try to find some sort of pore space or air space, in our healthy soil, we actually can see there's bubbles coming out as that water is easily able to move in. But once that water gets inside that soil, it actually creates a lot of internal pressure. And so it's starting to push out. And what we're seeing in our conventional soil sample is that that soil doesn't have any strength to it because that structure's been destroyed 
through tillage over time. Not only that, but it's lacking that that you know robust biological community that's creating those glues to help hold that soil together and so it's not able to withstand that internal pressure and so what ends up happening is it, it breaks apart we call this the slake test whereas in our healthy soil what do you notice that water was able to move in the oxygen was able to move out because it's got a robust biological community creating those glues and those compounds to help hold that soil together it creates a really strong solid soil uh, that can function properly and withstand the stresses that we see um, in these intense rainfall events so that was maybe what 30 seconds and this is what we have left of our conventional sample and then we can move our healthy sample in and out and we can see maybe a little bit of slaking. But what I want you to notice is if it is slaking, it's slaking in larger pieces. And then also notice the difference in water quality. And so when we have a soil that doesn't have strength, that's been highly managed, you can notice that how cloudy the water is. And what that is, is it's the finer particles in our soil. It's the clays and the organic matters that are now dispersed in the water column. And if you think about how water travels over a farm field, it's these particles that are then trapped in the water that move into our rivers and our lakes and our streams. And the reason that's important, it's the finer particles, the clays and the organic matters that hold onto our soil fertility. So you're losing the most valuable part of your soil you're losing the part that you're investing your inputs and your fertilizers in because they're bound to those smallest soil particles. You're losing them then to runoff uh, when you have those intense rainfall events. And the most important thing is keeping your soil in, per in place and keeping those particles on the field doing the work uh, that you've paid for them to do. Okay, so let's move over here. We're gonna talk about what we call infiltration. So infiltration is how water moves down through the soil. So here we've got, again, two soil samples. This one here is our conventionally farmed sample. And this is our healthy soil. And you can see already they're a little bit different how they look in these pitchers. And so the bottom of these pitchers have holes drilled into them. We're going to see how water moves differently down through each of these soil samples. So we're going to simulate a rainfall event by putting these two cups in here. And then we've got two bottles of water that represents about an inch of rain for the diameter of container that we have here. So green sort of just indicates this is our, our healthy system, and the red indicates a system that's uh, conventionally or highly managed. So I want you not only to watch what's happening in the container, but I want you to see what's happening underneath our container. And so what happens when we have a rainfall event, and so if you think about it, a raindrop that's falling from the sky can fall at speeds up to 20 miles an hour. And that's a lot of energy that's held within that raindrop. So as the raindrop hits the soil surface, that energy has to go somewhere. So the raindrop's going to hit that soil surface, and it looks like a little bit like an explosion going off. And so it transfers that energy into the soil particles, and that's what causes it to move. So we want to make sure that we've got a soil that's strong enough to withstand those raindrop impacts and help hold that soil in place. And so unfortunately, if we have a system where we don't have that soil strength to our advantage, then what we end up seeing is we end up seeing a lot of soil movement. So you can see after that one rainfall event how much soil movement we have on that farm field. And so where does that all end up going then? Once that water hits that soil surface, if it doesn't have those pore spaces that we talked about, if it can't move down through the soil, then that water has nowhere to go but across, across the field and into our surface waterways. And again, remember, what is it carrying with it as it's moving across the farm field? It's carrying the most productive and the most valuable part of our soil, the soil that's the parts of our soil that are holding on to the fertility. 
And unfortunately, that nitrogen and that phosphorus that's carried in those soil particles are what most negatively impact our, our water quality and our surface waters. So we want to make sure we're keeping our soil in place. So this is really ideally what we want our soil fields to look like, our, our, our agricultural fields. We want to have ample residue to help act like a blanket to really minimize the impact of that raindrop uh, impact. Um, that residue acts very much like a blanket to help minimize the blows that we have from the raindrops. Not only that, but it helps keep that soil moisture from evaporating and it also helps moderate soil temperature. So residue is a really, really key and important part of a soil health system. And we wanna make sure we have as much diversity in the system as possible. So here after just talking uh, for a few minutes, you can see how much water has infiltrated down into our container. And so what's happening in these soils is very much similar to what was happening over here. As that raindrop hits that soil surface, and those fine particles start to disperse. They're gonna kind of settle down into the cracks and the crevices into the soil surface. And those little aggregates are gonna slake in an unhealthy soil. And so really what happens is in an unhealthy soil system, it basically seals that soil surface off. And so what little chance that soil had to move water down is now sealed off and that water's only got one place to go and that's across the field. And so here you can see how much water, we put an inch, that inch of water, we have very little water at all uh, that's moved down into the, the tank below. Here I'll move these stickers out of the way so that you can see. Here we've got a lot more water that infiltrated and pretty much nothing in this container here. And so we really want to make sure that we're having as much water move down into that soil because our soil is basically like a big water tank. And we want to make the most of the rainfalls that we do get so we can store that water clear into the next growing season. If we have a fully functioning soil health system, when we have all of the gears turning and, every, and all of the pistons firing and everything working in concert with one another, uh, we get a highly efficient soil. So this particular picture is a pretty famous picture. This was uh, taken by Jay Fuhr out in Bismarck, North Dakota. He's an employee with USDA. This is Gabe Brown's field. Gabe is a, a very uh, popular soil health farmer out in North Dakota. So this is Gabe's field after 13 inches of rain in about a 24-hour period. Now this isn't a very highly sloping field by any stretch of the imagination. It's very gently rolling, fairly flat. Gabe has been doing uh, no-till since the 90s. Uh, he's got a highly diverse uh, rotational system. He has livestock on his operation. Um, and after 13 inches of rain, you can see there's no standing water on his fields. So he was able to capture 13 inches of moisture, hold that in his soil profile clear into the next growing season. So this is really what we're shooting for. This is sort of the ideal system that we're looking for when we talk about a healthy soil or a soil health management system. Well, thanks so much for joining us today to learn a little bit about soil and soil health. Remember to come and find us at Little Farm Hands up at the north end of the fairgrounds, or if you want to learn more about the science of soil health and ways that you can incorporate that into your own home garden, make sure you check us out at the dirt stage at the Agriculture and Horticulture Building. Thanks again for joining us at the Minnesota State Fair. I'm Kristen Brennan, and I work with USDA NRCS out of Minnesota.